at UCBC, and I am the person in charge of AOR processing here. And most of you I have uh, dealt with in one capacity or another uh, in my past seven months here so far. Welcome to the AOR Basics and P3 Program Updates webinar. Um, I think this should be very informative to you. I heard from a lot of you that you really wanted to just sort of review the basics. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, let me show you the agenda. So um, in terms of the logistics, I would like this to be somewhat interactive. I do have some questions throughout the presentation, and I'd like you to go ahead and use the, the chat function to um, answer the questions. If you think you know the answer, type it in. Let's, let's be interactive here. I don't want you to fall asleep. Um, and also, if you have any other questions that come up um, as I'm doing the presentation, please feel free to put it in the chat, chat function. You are all muted right now. So um, if you really feel like you can't type something and you want to be able to speak, you can say, um, please unmute me or something like that, and I can unmute you so you can ask the question verbally um, if need be. But it, it tends to get a little bit unwieldy when people are unmuted. So. Um, so we're going to try to do it this way. Um, Alon, I see your question here, and we are definitely going to get to that. So be patient. <laughs> so we're going to go over today key issues in the P3 program, eligibility for uh, who is eligible to file an AOR, uh, the requirements of uh, the P3 program, how you go about actually submitting the AOR. We're going to review a sample AOR, which I think is going to be the most um, instructional part of this. And then if we have time, hopefully we can get to a few case scenarios uh, at the end. So in terms of the key issues, please keep in mind that filling out an AOR is just granting access to the US Refugee Admissions Program based on the anchor's family relationship and country of origin. So just filing it is not a guarantee that those family members are definitely going to be able to come to the United States. Um, keep in mind that the, the family members, the QFMs, that stands for Qualified Family Member, must prove that they have a persecution claim, which usually means that they have been granted refugee status in their uh, country of asylum. They also have uh, plenty of security and medical checks that they have to go through. There are very, very uh, many steps in the process. So just Keep in mind that uh, this is all about granting them access, but not guaranteeing that they're going to be able to, to come through. And we'll go over more of the requirements, of course, later. Um, the AOR process does require an investment of staff time. I know that it can be very time consuming, but please keep in mind that it is a requirement um, in the cooperative agreement with the State Department that um, you have to inform clients about the P3 program and their options, as well as other family reunification options. Um, it's really important to assess their eligibility up front. Um, I'd really hate to see you waste a lot of time filling out an AOR only to send it to me and have, you, have me tell you, well, this person's not eligible. Um, if you ever have questions um, in the beginning of the process, please contact me sooner rather than later to, to minimize waste of time. So we recommend that you use um, this worksheet uh, that you should all have access to. I'll also send it out in an email after this webinar, just in case you don't, that you can go through with the anchor to um, make sure that all of the qualifications are met. Um, it, it helps to, to fill out this worksheet first and then go to the online AOR um, when you're not sitting there with the anchor. OK. So um, we also uh, need to make sure that we're looking out for the possibility of fraud. The P3 program was entirely shut down uh, at one point because of too many instances of fraud. Um, and that is your responsibility to make sure that the claimed relationships, I mean, not that you can verify it, but just have your guard up and make sure if there's any red flags that maybe this person isn't telling me the truth, maybe this isn't. Um, the, the, maybe this relationship isn't what they're telling me. Make sure you uh, keep, keep your eye out for that and, and, of course, alert me to that if you have any concerns. And you have to provide DNA counseling to the, the anchor. 
the family must be prepared to address what the DNA testing may reveal. It may reveal things that the anchor doesn't know. Um, there can be lots of issues. So you do have to make sure that as the AOR processing person that you're providing that, um, that counseling. And so along those lines, there is this form called the P3 DNA Testing Information for Anchor Relatives form that we do recommend that you go over with the anchor relative. Again, I will email this to you after the webinar to make sure that you have this. And you, you need to go over each of these things with the anchor and then have them sign it um, along with an interpreter if you're using an interpreter after you've gone over this all to prove that you, that you did do the, um, the counseling about the DNA. Um, let's move on. So that's, that covers the key issues. So let's review the eligibility requirements. Uh, as you all know, I think already, there are only certain countries of origin that are eligible for the P3 program. So here's a list of the current um, countries that are, that are eligible. Um, you should have this list available to you at all times. Um, I will be emailing you this, this um, PowerPoint presentation so that you can uh, cut and paste this if you like and if you don't already have it in some kind of written form somewhere else. Now, if the qualified family members, if the, if the beneficiaries are located in their country of nationality, if they have not fled to a second country, they're not eligible for this. Also, if they are currently in Syria, Iran, Canada, Jordan, or certain parts of Turkey, they also cannot be part of the P3 program due, due to difficulties in processing in those countries. Um, if you do have someone come in and their family members are in Turkey, please just contact me. Um, and uh, I'll review whether that particular area of Turkey is, um, is okay or not. I have a question asking if Sudan includes uh, South Sudan, and my understanding is that it does. Emily, I know you're on this uh, webinar too. Can you, if you have an answer to that, can you maybe um, send me a chat real quick if Sudan includes South Sudan? That's a really good question. Um, I have another question that came up. In a case where the family member is a niece or nephew that's considered a child, is the DNA test needed? How will it help? Um, and we'll get into this with the, with the DNA um, portion of the presentation later. So um, Aisha, just hold on to that question, please. And if I don't answer it, please um, check with me again. Emily's going to check on the, um, the question about South Sudan. So she'll get back to us on that. And I'm going to keep moving in the meantime. Okay, so here's our first question, interactive portion. So a Bhutanese refugee who's in the U.S. wants to file for her husband who is a Nepali citizen residing in Nepal. Is the family eligible for the P3 program? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Type me an answer real quick. No, someone says. Marnie. Yep, Marnie, you are correct. No. By definition, the beneficiary must be a refugee, which means they must be outside of their country of origin. So if this person's a Nepali citizen and they're in Nepal, they're, they do not qualify. Um, before I get to the next question, um, I have a question about what about SIVs. SIVs are not part of this program. Um, I'll get to that when we go through more eligibility parts, okay? But uh, we'll certainly answer that question. All right, an anchor's mother and her three uh, siblings, who are all under 21, are living in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. The anchor siblings are all Eritrean, but the mother was born in Ethiopia. Is the family eligible for the P3 program? What do you guys think? This is taken from actually an, uh, a real case that we recently had um, with uh, Chicago. So someone says yes. It's actually, uh, some, some people are saying yes. Well, it's, a, it's kind of tricky. Um, the answer is actually no, because the mother, who's the qualified family member, is living in her country of origin. She's Ethiopian. She's living in Ethiopia. So she does not meet that eligibility requirement. The siblings, who technically do meet the eligibility requirement, they're derivatives, and they can't derive status from someone if someone doesn't, she, they can't derive their status from the mother if the mother doesn't meet the eligibility requirement. Um, we'll get in more about the siblings and why they're derivatives and not qualified family members in just a moment. So that was a little bit of a trick question. 
So anchor requirements. The anchor, who, the person who comes to you, must be at least 18 years old. They must have entered the U.S. as a refugee or asylee, not an SUV, an SUV, SIV, sorry, not an SIV. Um, there's a whole other program available for particularly Iraqi, families of Iraqi um, SIV recipients that you can find on the uh, USCIS website if you search for um, Iraqi SIV family reunification, I think it should come up. But they are not, not eligible for the P3 program. And they must have entered within the past five years, and they have to provide proof of legal immigration status. Oh, man, the answer came up. It wasn't supposed to come up. So the documents that you need to ask the anchor for to prove his or her eligibility um, means their I-94 card if they're um, not a permanent resident yet, or their LPR card, or if they were able to obtain citizenship, um, say through uh, marrying a, a U.S. citizen before five years, they can provide uh, that documentation as well. And so you need to scan that, and that is part of the AOR application, that proof of eligibility or proof of uh, legal immigration status. You also want to copy their state ID or driver's license, and just keep that for your records in your file. So the qualified family member requirement. Uh, they can be the parents of the anchor, the spouse, unmarried children under 21 years of age, that is unmarried children of the anchor. They, um, qualified family members all must establish their own persecution claim or have refugee status, same thing. Um, now this is a new part. They must be able to show proof of registration in their country of asylum. Okay, um, same with the derivatives. Uh, all beneficiaries listed on the AOR must be able to show proof of registration in the country of asylum. Now, that uh, requirement varies from country to country. So I wanted to go over this uh, list of exit formalities with you all to show the differences. In Africa, as you can see, um, in Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Djibouti, and South Africa, they're requiring both verification from the UNHCR office there and from the, the local government, from the, the country government. Both are required. Um, in Europe, as you can see there, it's just the government. Same with Ecuador. In um, Middle East, North Africa, it's only UNHCR requirement, that, uh, proof that's required. South Asia, Nepal is from the government. In India, it's from UNHCR. Pakistan, it could be from either. Sri Lanka, from UNHCR. And uh, in Turkey, you can see the difference, differences there in the various countries. It's um, either the UNHCR and the government or just the UNHCR. Now, Burmese applicants that are in Malaysia and Thailand are exempted from this. They do not have to show proof of registration, but everyone else does. So that means you have to copy. Uh, the anchor has to have this with them when they come to see you. And you have to um, copy and scan it, or, you are, or they give it to you in electronic form, whichever, um, and provide that with the AOR when you file it now. So this is a change. All right, let me go back. So proof of registration in the country of asylum. The uh, derivatives, the qualified family member derivatives, also called type B. We'll go over that when we, when we go over the form. Those are people who derive their status from the main QFM, which means they do not have to have their own persecution claim. Okay? They derive their persecution claim from the QFM. So the people that, are, um, that, that qualify as derivatives are the spouses, a spouse of a QFM, the unmarried children under 21 of the QFM. Um, again, if it's the unmarried children under 21 of the anchor, they're up here. They're a QFM. They're not a derivative. Okay. Um, and again, they, they also have to provide proof of registration in the country of asylum. Here's a question. The anchor tells you that he wants to file for his wife, but they had a traditional marriage three years ago, and there was no official state record of the marriage. He never told the RSC or DHS, Homeland, Homeland Security, during his refugee interviews a year ago that he was married. 
So this is the first time he's claiming that he's married. What do you advise the anchor? Um, does anyone have any ideas? If so, feel free to type it in. Someone says file an I-130 instead. Um, I don't think that that would work uh, because still go, that still goes through uh, Homeland Security, and they're still going to say, hey, wait, you never said you were married before. Someone says get the certificate of marriage. Okay, well, the marriage must have been legal in the country in which it took place. And the U.S. must be able to recognize it, too, which means polygamous marriages are not um, counted. So you might request to see evidence that the marriage is legal, like a marriage certificate, like someone said. Although a marriage certificate is not required for the AOR application, it may be required during the process, especially if he did not report to DHS about his marriage. So you don't have to provide, when you, when you send the AORs to me to file, we, we don't have to submit marriage certificates. But this may come up later during the interviewing process um, because they're going to have access to um, the anchor's previous you know, refugee application and all his paperwork. And if it comes up that you know, he never reported he was married, it's certainly going to raise a lot of red flags. So um, you would advise the, the anchor to um, try to obtain a, uh, some sort of proof of marriage. Someone said an affidavit or a witness statement that may be helpful. Um, you know, so I think it sort of depends on, on the interviewer, what they're willing to accept, but uh, that's just a red flag to be watching out for. So the, the um, type C of uh, people that are um, beneficiaries on an AOR are called add-ons. Now, add-ons are um, very difficult to, to get. They're rarely granted because they must meet very strict criteria, and they have to have their own independent persecution claim. So remember how we said the derivatives derive their status from, their, from the QFM? They don't have to have their own claim. The add-ons do. They have to have their own refugee status, their own independent persecution claim. So the strict criteria that these must meet, the person must have lived in the same household in the country of nationality, not in the country of asylum, although that may be true as well. But the country of nationality is the, is the important piece here. They must be, have been part of the same economic unit in the country of nationality, again, before they fled to the country of asylum. And three, they must be able to, you must be able to show exceptional and compelling humanitarian circumstances. Now, that's a really hard um, burden right there. Basically, what that means is you have to be able to show that this person would be left without any social, economic, and or psychological support or that their security would be compromised if they were left behind. So this is a pretty high burden. Um, this, so this is for people like uh, someone that just sort of uh, started living with the family. Often this happens in the country of asylum in a camp. You know, someone sort of unofficially adopts a child that doesn't have a family and they're living with, you, with this family in the camp. Um, that that well, the situation I just said wouldn't wouldn't actually qualify because they didn't live together in the country of nationality. Now let's go on because I have a question about this. So the anchor is filing for her father and family. She tells you that her 85 year old grandfather has been living with the family for the past 25 years since his wife passed away. When the family fled to the country of asylum 10 years ago, her grandfather left with them. Grandfather currently resides with the family and relies on them for support. He has poor vision, memory problems, and besides his family, he has no other sources of income and support. Is this grandfather eligible to be included as an add-on? What do you guys think? Type it in. I see a yes. Remember, because he's a grandfather, he couldn't be a QFM, and he couldn't even be a derivative. So his only chance is as an add-on. Someone says yes if he has a claim of persecution. Very good, yes. All right, let's look at our answer here. Looks like you guys are all getting it. So yes, the grandfather lived in the same household of the QFM in the country of origin, was part of the same economic unit in the country of nationality, and he demonstrates exceptional and compelling humanitarian need for inclusion given his health problems and lack of other financial support. But um, as Alexa pointed out, he also needs to be able to prove that he's a refugee. So that's something that's not included in the answer here, but is an important point. So uh, another uh, bit about um, the relationships, they must exist at the time that the anchor enters the U.S. 
and continue to, and continue to exist at the time you file the AOR. So um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Now, it's okay if a child that's listed as um, either 2FM or derivative turns 21 during the process, as long as the AOR is filed before the 21st birthday. Now, unless they get married, because the, the, they must still be unmarried to qualify. But if they turn 21 after the AOR is filed, it's okay. Emily has just responded that, yes, South Sudan and Sudan are both eligible countries for the P3 program. So to go back to that question that was asked earlier, yes, South Sudan is an eligible country. Thanks, Emily, for looking that up. All right, here's another question. The anchor tells you that he came to the U.S. as a refugee in 2011. He traveled to Kenya to marry his fiance in January 2013. He now wants to, the word miss, is a miss, uh, there's a word missing there. He now wants to file an AOR for his wife. What do you tell him? Well, what do you guys think? Well, he can't file an AOR for his wife because the marriage relationship did not exist when he was admitted to the U.S. as a refugee. Only family-based petition available would be the I-130 immigrant relative petition. Aisha, you get uh, brownie points because that's what you put in your answer. Good job. All right, unborn children, if a child was conceived but not yet born on the date that the anchor was admitted to the U.S. as a refugee or asylee, that relationship will be considered to exist as of the date the anchor was admitted to the U.S. Okay? Step relationships. The marriage creating the step relationship must have occurred before the child's 18th birthday in order for the step parent or stepchild to be claimed as a qualified family member or a derivative. So keep these two things in mind if you ever come across these situations. All right, an anchor, 30 years old, his father married his stepmother 11 years ago, so do the math, and passed away five years ago. The anchor wants to file for his stepmother his step and half siblings who are all under 21 years old and unmarried. What do you tell him? Well, he can't file for his stepmother because if he did the math, the marriage took place when he was 19, not 18 or under. So he cannot file for his siblings as they are not eligible. His siblings would only be eligible as derivatives. They can't be derivatives because the qualified family member is not eligible. Adoptions. Um, in order for adopted children to be eligible, the children must have been in the legal custody of and resided with the adopting parents for at least two years and have been legally adopted before their 16th birthday or be the natural sibling of a child described above um, and been adopted themselves before their 18th birthday. So this is a little bit complicated. I know it's kind of confusing. If you've run into a situation with an adopted child, gather the information. You can always give me a call. We'll talk it through. We'll figure it out. Here's a question. The anchor tells you that she left her 12-year-old adopted child in Ethiopia. What information do you need to find out from the anchor? We need to know when the adoption took place, how long the child had lived with her as her legally adopted daughter, whether the adoption was legal in the country in which it occurred, and whether there is an adoption certificate. So these are the kind of questions that you would want to know. So let's move on to the requirements, um, the documentation requirements for the anchor. As we went over earlier, they have to provide proof of legal status. Um, we went over what that includes, and you need their government-issued ID for your records. The beneficiaries, the people that are overseas, okay, they need their proof of registration in the country of asylum, as we went over. Um, that's either from UNHCR and the government or one or the other, depending on the country of asylum. And if it involves an adopted child, you do need a copy of the adoption papers. These are the only documentation requirements. So marriage certificates, um, other, other types of documentation are not required to be submitted with the AOR application. Not to say that the beneficiary shouldn't have those handy and take them with them to the interview, but this is just what's um, required to be submitted with the AOR. Um, we do need photos, passport style photos, with a clear full frontal face view of each person applying uh, for whom the anchor is applying. The hairline and the ears must be visible. So if someone wears a hijab, they do have to pull it back so that the hairline and the ears are showing. We have had uh, AORs returned um, for, for that reason and said these photos don't qualify. 
Um, the photos must have been taken within the last six months. And you have to make sure that they're in the .bmp or .tif format um, when you attach them to the AOR. We'll go over that in a minute when we go over the form as well. And um, you know they can be taken by a cell phone. They don't have to be professional um, passport photos as long as they're passport style photos, meaning they're a close-up shot of the of the face. Um, DNA testing is a requirement for the P3 program, but it's only required for children and parents of the anchor. So in answer to um, the question that was asked earlier about a niece or nephew that's considered a child, that person would be an add-on, okay, as we went through, right? That, that would be an add-on because a, person, a niece or nephew is not a QFM or a derivative. And so add-ons do not require a DNA, um, DNA test. Okay, I hope that, that's clear now. So only children and parents have to get DNA testing. So the anchor tests first in the states here. He pays for all the kits at the lab when he goes. He has to go to an AABB accredited facility. There's a website with all the facilities listed. And that website link is given in the letter that is sent to the anchor when it's time to do this. OK, the average cost is $440 for one or two parents against one child, and then an additional $220 for each additional child. So the anchor pays this up front, and then if all of the relationships are confirmed when the beneficiaries overseas then do their testing, Iowa will issue a reimbursement check to the anchor. Now, they say they'll do it within six weeks of the relationship confirmation. Whether it's really being done that fast, I'm not sure, but that's what they're telling us. Now, the spouse relationship obviously is not determined by DNA, so that is just... Um, talked about at the interview, and that's when like a marriage certificate would be shown uh, and whatnot. So obviously spouses are not part of the DNA testing. Special considerations. If you have an anchor, say it's a husband who files for his wife and three children, two of the children are his biological children, and one of them is not. Now while the wife overseas knows that the child is not her husband's biological child, he does not know that. So. Your next steps would be um, when this is uh, your DNA um, counseling with the anchor. You should go over all of this with him and ask him to have a conversation with his wife. Um, the wife at that point, in being told this information, should disclose this information at the pre-screening interview. Now, after disclosure, the RSC will not request that that child be tested against the anchor and will at that time advise the wife to tell her husband. The anchor then, the husband, will then have six months to revise his AOR and resubmit it. Hopefully that won't ever happen to you, but just in case. So in terms of actually submitting the AOR, you need to convert it into a PDF. Um, to do that, you, you know what, I'll go through that when I open the um, PDF, uh, I'm sorry, when I open the uh, form in a second. So someone says, so is that child now a QFM, not a derivative? Is that child? So a child who is not his biological child would be neither a QFM or a derivative. The argument you would make at that point would be um, that they're an add-on. Okay? In terms of that scenario, we just went over. Someone just asked a question about that. Uh, so once you create the PDF, you email it to me along with the proof of immigration status and the proof of registration. Um, you email it to me. I will then review it, and I'll get back to you if any changes need to be made. You need to make those changes and you know meet with the, AO, the anchor again if you need to and resend it to me ASAP. I have a lot of cases where someone submits an AOR to me, and I send back changes that need to be, be made, and then I never hear from them again. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. But please know that an AOR is not filed until I submit it to our RPT. And I will let you know when I've submitted it. So if, unless you get an email from me saying, okay, this has been submitted, then don't think, don't assume it has. This is especially important not to let this, this lag if the children are uh, close to turning 21. Um, so before we go through the case scenarios, I wanted to go, through, go over an actual um, AOR form, and I did to have it open already. Give me just a second. I apologize. Here it is, sample AOR. 
All right, so this should be helpful. We're going to go through it. All right, so this is all um, made up information. A lot, most of this is very um, self-explanatory. I won't spend a lot of time, but case file ID is the alien number. Sometimes people put um, social security numbers or other things there. Make sure that's the, the anchor's alien number. Um, ECDC is obviously the National Resettlement Agency. And then you put your affiliate ID number here. In this case, I put, um, I put NICE's ED as an example, or ID. So um, in filling out the information, please make sure that the last name is in all caps, but only the last name is in all caps. I can't tell you how many AORs I get where everything is in all caps. Okay, Please don't do that. Uh, um, if someone doesn't have a middle name, and this goes, I mean, in, throughout the whole form, if something doesn't apply, please, NA, do not leave it blank. Please make sure all um, dates are in this format that they, um, that they have here of the, the, the date, the three letters for the month and the year. Um, you have to list, if the anchor is married, you just list their name here. Notice, it's, it's only their name. You'll have to put more information about the spouse later in another section. But here, you just list their name. The city and country of birth. Sometimes you only put one or the other. Make sure you put both. The current address here in the state. Phone numbers and um, email addresses if, if they have them. Their date of arrival. If they know their country of processing or their overseas uh, case number, you can fill that in. If they don't know it, put unknown, and, and that's fine. And of course, you have to click what their um, current immigration status is over here. Now, this is the first QFM, right, um, in section 2A1. Now, what we have listed here is the anchor's father. Um, please notice. The city and country of birth is required. Again, people often don't put both. The nationality, make sure we're checking that this is a nationality that is, is uh, eligible for the P3 program. Their marital status currently, and the date and place of their current marriage. So if they're currently married, we have to put the, the date and the place that they were married. This is another thing that people often don't put the, the place of marriage here. Um, if they're still married, obviously it's going to be NA for termination of marriage. And their relationship to the anchor goes here. Um, in this case, it's father. So drop down, you choose the relationship. And you upload the photo. In this case, I uploaded a photo of myself. <laughs> but you click Browse, and you find where the photo was saved. Make sure it's in the right format. You notice here this is in the right format. And you just click open and it will add it. And now I've just unadded it or taken it out. But you know what I'm you know what I'm saying. I can just do it again. All right. Click that, open, and it's added. Okay. You need to put the mailing address of where the QFM lives as much detail as you can. Sometimes people just say the name of the camp and that's it and they think that's enough. Please give it as much detail as you can about where the QFM is living. If they have a phone number, way to be contacted or even an email address. Please include all that you can. And if there's any other way of contacting, perhaps another family member that's overseas, um, put that information here in the alternate address. Often it's not applicable. If so, just put uh, NA. And then uh, the section B here, as you can see, derivative of qualifying family member in section, a, a, in section 2A of this page, or C, members of the same economic unit. So, Type B derivatives or type C add-ons. That's what goes down here. You notice on the far left, you have to choose a type. Choose either type B or C. Now, the first person here is going to be a uh, derivative. Let's go through why that person is a derivative. As you, uh, let's see if anyone can guess. Can you, can you take a look at this person listed on line two and see if you can tell why they are a derivative, not a, um, not a, a I'm sorry, why they're an add-on, not a derivative. Any guesses? Look at the date of birth. Yep, Aisha got it. Good. This person's too old. They're over 21. 
so they can't be a type B derivative. So I've added them as a type C add-on. Now, for type C, you have to explain all those criteria that I went over earlier in Section 4. So we will get to that, and I'll show you in Section 4 where I describe why this person, this add-on, should be admitted as an add-on. The next person is a type B um, because they are an unmarried uh, sister of the anchor, daughter of the QFM. Okay, see this this column is for the relationship to the QFM. This column is for the relationship to the anchor. Uh, they're under 21 and unmarried, so they qualify as a derivative. And then that is all that there is on this page. Um, now, also, we have added another QFM in section, uh, in section 2A on the next page, and that is the anchor's mother. So the anchor's father was on the first page, and we had the derivatives. Now the anchor's mother is also um, wants to come over. Now, the reason we, we don't list the mother as a derivative under the father is because the mother has her own status as a QFM. She, just, she's, she doesn't have to be a derivative. She qualifies as a qualified family member. So we list her on her own page. Okay. Again, notice all of the proper things are filled out. We have attached the photo in the correct format. It's the same address. And there are no other siblings or um, people to be added, so that's why this is all blank. The type here, once you type in an, a letter, it doesn't let you get rid of it. And so I, t I took this from a form that had already been filled out, so that's why those letters are there. So ignore that. When you're starting with a fresh form, those will all be blank. All right, so there's no other QFM, so these next few pages here are all blank. Now we get to Section 3. This is very important, and people often miss this. Look at this part right here, Section 3. Information about all of your relatives not previously provided in Section 2. These are only for people that we did not already list in Section 2. You do not have to relist those same people again. They only have to be listed once. So um, for the father and mother section, I put section, C Section 2, C Section 2A, because that is where their information is listed. If this anchor was fi filing for someone other than his parents, you, you would have to put all of this information in. Okay. Um, often, uh, I find that parents of anchors are deceased. And it's over in this section where you check whether they're living deceased or unknown. Um, I've I had many situations where, say, the father is living or the mother is deceased or vice versa. And so there's a confusion about what to put for the marital status. As long as they were married at the time of death, you just can keep it as, uh, as married. Um, and then put, uh, well, actually, you know how I told you to put not applicable in boxes where something is inapplicable. In this case, when you when you try typing not applicable, it won't let you um, see it says it's invalid. So it won't let you do that. So just leave it blank. And then you have to put the last city and country known of where this person lived, whether they're um, um, li living or deceased. Um, under Section B, um, if, this, if the anchor has adoptive parents, or step parents or foster parents, this is where you would list this information. So up here is for birth, birth parents. Down here is for any other uh, type of parents. If it's, if it's not applicable, put it not applicable. Type uh, section C here, you have to list the spouse. So remember how on page one I told you we listed the spouse's name? Sometimes people come to me and say, well, we already listed the spouse. Why do we have to list it here? Because that was only their name. This is the full information for the spouse. So please fill out all of the information, city, country of birth, the status, whether they're current or former spouse, um, date and place. Oh, see, look, I messed up here. I put the date of marriage, but I did not put the place. So I would, uh, in reviewing this, I would have returned it. Um, and then the if they if this is a former spouse, put the date of uh, termination, current city uh, or last known city or country, whether they're living deceased or unknown. Um, I just got a question that says, why, why we are not listing the mother or the father as derivatives in Section 2A? Because they're not derivatives. They have their own status as qualified family members. 
Remember when we went over the eligibility of who qualifies as a, qual as a qualified family member? It's the parents of the anchor, the spouse of the anchor, or the unmarried children under 21 of the anchor. If they meet those requirements, they are their own qualified family member. The only time they have to be someone has to be listed as a derivative is if they are not one of those three things. So if they're a sibling of the anchor and they're under 21 and unmarried, they can be a derivative, for example. Okay? That's why. I hope that's clear. All right. So section three, you have to list all of your children. Again, it's pe people who were not previously provided in section two. So if he had listed some of his children in section two as people that he wanted to bring over, um, we would not repeat that information here. This is only for people that were not already listed. In this case, I put NA, um, he doesn't have any children. But please keep that in mind. Uh, brothers and sisters. If, uh, as you can see uh, in section one, in section two, we listed two of his uh, sisters, didn't we? So I put C section two here. If he had other siblings that were not listed in section two, we would need to put their information here. Often there's there's like eight or nine siblings listed here, and sometimes people get frustrated that they have to provide all of that information, and they say, "Well, I, the anchor can't remember. He doesn't know. Whatever. Do your best. They have to fill this out um, because." If this information is not complete and, they, and, and, and it goes through an interview, if there's any discrepancies, um, it really jeopardizes the whole case. So really stress to them that it's important uh, to, put, to, to include all of the information right up, right up front here. Um, if they don't know the date of birth, do their best to estimate it and then check the box. Uh, city or country of birth, marital status, uh, current or last known city and country, living, deceased, or unknown, and the relationship to the anchor. So all these different types of sibling relationships all have to be listed. Stepsisters, adopted brothers, foster sisters, all of that, okay? Uh, let's go to, all right, this is section four. So this is for the add-on. Remember I said in section four we were going to talk about um, the add-on. So in this case, this was left over from the AOR I took this from, so that's wrong. So we're it's section two, section two, number two, which was the add-on. I I describe here my sister Ola Abdi is physically disabled and unable to care for herself. She's had severe cerebral palsy since birth. She's always lived with our parents and has been cared for by them both in Ethiopia, which if you remember is their country of origin, and in Kenya, which is their country of asylum. She fled to Kenya with the whole family in 2000 and is registered as a refugee with UNHCR. So that shows that she has her own uh, independent claim of persecution. Uh, our parents provide for all of her financial support and physical care. She would not be able to care for herself if our parents left Kenya without her and there are no other family members in Kenya that can care for her. So that explanation there, those few sentences covers all of the criteria that I mentioned. So this person would most likely be accepted as an add-on. Um, keep in mind, uh, you know, I, I, I used in this example that she has severe, severe cerebral palsy. Maybe less severe cases might be accepted as an add-on. Um, I've had uh, an AOR that I submitted recently where the add-ons were the anchor sisters who are Iraqi, and they were all over 21. The only really explanation they could put here was that in their culture, women, um, you know, can't, they're not really um, left with, if they're left without a male um, family member, they could be vulnerable, uh, that sort of thing. And, and so the, um, the, the AOR processing person at that agency did their best to try to describe that. But to tell you the truth, I don't know if that's going to be accepted or not. We're going to have to wait and see. But we submitted it. So we'll see what happens with that. So that is section four, and um, so, some people have asked me, well, how do we how do we get the signature on this? You don't actually have to submit a signature. Um, this is all electronically done, so don't print this out and have the person sign and scan it back in. Don't do not create a PDF that way. Okay, don't worry about the signature, uh, but fill in the name, date, your name, date, and your affiliate name and address and phone number. So. Um, Oh, the next page is the photos. So if you attach the photos correctly in the earlier part, they should all be showing up here. So make sure you scroll through and make sure all of the photos for the um, 
for each person is uh, included here. Now, so, so this is the father and the two sisters that we talked about um, on Section 2. Section 2A is where the mother would go, because remember, she's her own QFM. So each QFM has their own page. If there was another QFM, it would go here. Okay, see how it says qualifying family member? And then all of the other pictures are the derivatives or add-ons. Okay, and that is uh, the entire form. In order to save it as a PDF, you go to File, Save Form As. No, I'm sorry, my bad. File and Print. Print. Now, in the drop-down here, you should have PDF Creator as an option. If you do not have PDF Creator as an option, you may need to download it. If you just Google PDF Creator, you'll find all kinds of free free downloads to create it, uh, to, to put it on your computer. And then click OK, and it will create a, um, a PDF of this form. And that is what you then send to me um, along with the PDF of the proof of immigration status, and now also the PDF of the proof of um, registration in the country of asylum. So down here, no, I don't want to download a new version. OK, so then this pops up. You can click uh, Save, and it'll ask you where you want to save your form. And that's, so that's how you save it as a PDF. OK, does anyone have a question about this AOR form? The actual just basics of filling out the form. Type it in the in the chat section if you have a question. And I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay, seeing none, let's uh, finish up with a few case scenarios. Okay, so again, type in the answer if you know it. Amina is a 16-year-old refugee from Somalia and was resettled last year. She comes to your office and asks if she can file an AOR for her mother, stepfather, and half-siblings who reside in Somalia. Is she eligible to file? Okay, I've got one right answer, two right answers. Looks like you guys got this one. So the answer, as you all uh, guessed, is no. Uh, she's not 18 years old. Um, and her family is still in the country of origin. She, remember, she said she's from Somalia, and her family are still in Somalia. So that's two reasons that she, that she is not eligible to file for her family members. Next question. Bashir is from Pakistan. He was granted asylum, asylum status in the U.S. on January 1, 2007, and is now a U.S. citizen. He comes to your office on December 2nd. 2013 to ask to file an AOR for his father and mother located in the UAE. Is he eligible to file? If you, whoops, ah, too, too many years have passed, someone says. Okay, so, no, he is not eligible to file because he's not from an eligible country. Pakistan is not on the list. Um, and he's had asylum status for over five years. And you can no longer do grandfathering. The grandfathering period is over. So, no, he is not eligible. Charlie is 30 years old, and he's from Iraq. He arrived in the U.S. as a refugee, unmarried, in 2011, and traveled to Jordan in 2012 to get married. His wife resides in Jordan. Simon, oh, why does it say Simon? I took, this from, I took this from someone else, so I didn't write these myself, so I'm sorry. It says Charlie and then Simon, so I'm not sure if that's supposed to be the same person. Let's say it's the same person. Charlie also has a stepmother, also from Iraq, who resides in Syria. His father is deceased. Can Simon file AORs for his wife and his stepmother? I think it's supposed to say Charlie throughout, so I apologize for that. I didn't catch that. All right, so some of you are answering. All right, good job. Let's see what we say. So for the wife. No, because the relationship, the marriage, did not exist at the time of his admission to the U.S. as a refugee. For his stepmother, maybe. What you need to find out is if they were married before he turned 18. So, sort of a trick question. You need more information. You need more information to find out about the stepmom. But the wife, definitely not.
Hello. Where's my next question? Oh, there it is. Dana is from Burma and is at your office asking if she can file an AOR. Her family resides in Thailand. Who in her family could be eligible to gain access to the P3 program? And let me just throw in here, um, because she's Burmese, the family's Burmese and they're living in Thailand, they'll be exempted from the proof of registration requirement, remember, that new requirement. Okay, so could her mother, could she file for her mother to gain access to the P3 program? Her quote unquote adopted sister, a 12 year old girl who her mother took in to care, to care for after they arrived in Thailand. What do you think about that one? Her 25 year old brother who has severe health and mental health conditions which render him unable to care for himself, and he relies on the, on the care from their mother. Is he eligible? And think about in what category. What about Dana's 18-year-old daughter who is married? I see you guys answering. You're doing a good job. Good. I'm glad you're thinking through this. And what about the father of her daughter who resides with his daughter and son-in-law? Dana and the father are not married. Okay. So Dana has this 18-year-old daughter who's married. The baby daddy <laughs> lives with his daughter and her husband. But Dana and the father were not married. All right. So the mother. Yes. Clearly, she qualifies as the QFM. The adopted sister, not a, a it's no, because um, clearly this uh, person was not taken into their care until after they arrived in the country of asylum. Um, I, someone put, if they could prove legal adoption, um, yeah, per perhaps if they could prove that there was a legal adoption in Thailand and the, the girls lived with them for more than two years, then yeah, that probably would work. So, so good job um, for Rachel for answering that. Um, for the brother, yes, he would be an add-on because even though he's over 21, his mental and uh, health and mental health conditions um, qualify him as an add-on. The uh, married daughter, no, because even though she's under 21, she's married. And the baby daddy, nope. That is not uh, an eligible relationship as either a QFM or a derivative or an add-on. Um, someone wrote, is Thailand in the list of qualifying countries? Not as a country of origin. Remember, the list of qualifying countries is for countries of origin. And in this case, we're talking about a Burmese family that's living in Thailand. So Burma is listed as a qualifying country of origin, and they're living in Thailand. So this is the, so that's okay. But if someone's from Thailand originally, no, that that does not qualify. That's not a qualifying country. Okay. Well, we are coming up on an hour, and we actually got through everything. I'm amazed. I thought it was going to take longer. Um, does anyone have any lingering questions? about AORs or the P3 program before we wrap up. Wow, I must have been so clear that everyone just knows everything about AORs now and is ready to just jump out and, and ask and, and fill out these AORs and we'll get all kinds of AORs filed in the next couple of months. <laughs> Alexa, you said yes, you have a question. Um, does that mean you want me to unmute you? Please answer yes or no whether you want me to unmute you. Oh, you wrote your question. How many of AOR submitted actually result in resettlement? They have not released any statistics to let us know that. So uh, there is no answer to that question. The a this new P3 program was just you know, relaunched recently. Um, I Emily, maybe you could um, jump in here. I think it's only been about a year, or has it even been a year yet? Uh, 
maybe it's coming up. Actually, yeah, it's been over a year. So it's coming up on, uh, in, I think in October it'll be two years that they restarted the P3 program. Um, and so they're not really releasing any statistics yet about uh, what, how many have actually resulted in uh, resettlement. Um, from our experience, we don't have any from this re after the relaunch that have actually come to the U.S. yet. We do have one that's very close. Um, the DNA tests have all been confirmed. They've gone through all the security checks, and they're sort of in the last last few phases. Um, so hopefully, we're going to have our first uh, person coming through the P3 program through ECDC very soon. Next question is uh, any length of time in processing from start to to finish to to the time of resettlement. Again, um, they're not giving us, the, uh, giving us that information. They're saying it could take up to two years. Um, it's, ju it's just so hard to know. And there, there's these things that keep coming up, like this new requirement of having to show the proof of registration. So that caused a, lo a long delay. Um, so we unfortunately are not able to give an actual precise estimation of how long it'll take. Um, about two years is probably a good guess. Uh, on average, how long does an AOR take to process from when I submit it to ECDC to when the QFM arrives in the U.S.? Okay, so that's basically what I just, the question that I just answered. Um, let's see, how do you take a picture for an AOR which requires ears and hairline are showing for a woman that wears a hijab? Well, we recently just had that issue, um, and what the, person, what the women did was they just pulled back their hijab just enough so that a little bit of hair was showing right at the temple, right at the top of the head, the temple there, and um, and and pulled it back so that their ears were showing. I'm assuming that a woman must have taken the photo, um, and that's how they were able to do that. But it can be done. Um, and someone has a question: um, options for Afghani SIVs. You know, I have not heard of any special program for the families for family reunification of Afghani SIVs, only for the Iraqi SIVs. So unfortunately, I don't know of any other options for Afghani SIVs um, if they don't bring their whole family with them when they come over. If I do have hear, hear of any, I'll certainly let you know. Um, all right. It's just about 1 o'clock. I want to thank you guys for being such um, a participatory audience and playing along and answering the questions. You all did a great job. You were really thinking through uh, things, which is which is great, because that's really what you got to do as you're working on this. So I will send out an email with the documents that we went over um, to make sure that you have them, as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I also will record this. Uh, this record webinar is recorded, and you can share it with other people at your agency if you need to, or if perhaps you have to do training for another person at your agency to start doing AORs, please make sure that they watch this webinar. Um, we now have an, uh, a YouTube channel, an ECDC YouTube channel, so the, the video will be posted there. Um, someone asks, when are we going to have one again? When are we going to have another webinar? Is that your question? Um, we're probably not going to have another webinar on AORs unless I get a lot of feedback saying you need another one. And if, if you do feel like it, if you do feel like you need further training, maybe on a specific part of of the P3 program or of AORs, maybe something that you want to go into into more detail or something that you feel that wasn't clear, let me know. And if we need to do like a shorter specialized webinar, I can certainly schedule that. Um, otherwise, we probably won't go over it again until the national training um, next spring. But I'm open to doing as much training as, as is needed. Always, please call me. Any of you are welcome to call me anytime you have a question. I'm happy to go over any of your questions with you. And uh, at this point, we are finished, so I'm going to say thanks very much, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.